wireless networks of uh, these tiny embedded devices commonly known as uh, wireless sensor networks have numerous applications to name a few the first well known deployment of a sensor network was to monitor a habitat of birds today they can also be used to monitor even the other extreme end active volcanoes there was a deployment on the golden gate bridge to monitor its structural health the most important of all is the internet of things in the very near future things ranging from our arts to our headphones will be on the internet all these applications have a fundamental requirement the capability to disseminate large amounts of data typically the disseminated data is an executable program that is disseminated from the base station node to every other node in the network this fundamental service is required throughout the life of a sensor application starting from its development phase to the end of its use for all purposes for which a dissemination protocol is used its dissemination completion time is the critical metric despite of its importance completion time for existing protocols is still in the order of minutes they can easily take more than 5 minutes to disseminate a few tens of kilobytes of data over typical deployments the culprit is the need for resolving contention among nodes for the underlying wireless channel on the other hand we propose a new protocol called splash that does not require contention resolution and compared to existing solutions splash reduces dissemination time by an order of magnitude from minutes to a few seconds it is able to do so by mainly exploiting constructive interference and channel diversity these two entities allow us to create a packet pipeline which some works somewhat similar to instruction pipelining for cpus however there is a key difference instead of a single lane we create multiple parallel packet pipelines the key feature of our pipeline is that a non root node is busy at all times if you can notice it is either transmitting or receiving a packet at any given point of time thus attempting to maximize throughput at every node in the network before we go into its details let me tell you that we call this tree pipelining and it works as follows given a dissemination tree to begin the root node transmits the first packet in the first pipeline cycle and we make sure that this packet is received by only first of nodes in the second cycle instead of contending with each other these first of nodes forward the received packet at the same time so that they interfere constructively at the next stop allowing its nodes to decode correctly decode the packet despite of overlapping transmissions this way we eliminate the need for contention resolution at at the same level of a at the nodes that belong to a same level of the tree the challenge was to ensure that different nodes forward received packets at the same time while accommodating all the other functionalities of splash to continue in the third cycle there are parallel transmissions of two different packets the root node is transmitting its second packet while the first packet is being forwarded further down the tree as they are two different packets they cannot interfere constructively they collide to result in packet corruption to avoid such corruption we exploit channel diversity we make sure that such parallel transmissions always occur on non interfering channels so by exploiting constructive interference and channel diversity we eliminate the need for contention resolution across the entire tree that is across the entire network this way once the pipeline is filled except the root node which only transmits any other node in the network is busy at all times it is either transmitting or receiving a packet at any given point of time in other words as i said before we create multiple parallel packet pipelines covering all nodes in the network thus maximizing throughput at every node in the network while tree pipelining allows us to maximize the transmission throughput 
it reception reliability is much lesser than the required reliability of 100 percent. By 100 percent reliability, I mean that every node has to receive the entire disseminated program object, because partial programs are of no use. To achieve such high reliability, Splash uses these, key, these four key techniques. First, we exploit the diversity available in transmission density, particularly to handle the scalability problem of constructive interference. Recently, it was shown that constructive interference is not scalable. What I mean is, as the number of concurrent transmitters increases, the reception reliability decreases. While the, th the recent work is theoretical, our real world examples demonstrate the fact that the problem is more severe in practice. As depicted, only three nodes is enough, only three concurrent transmitters is enough to degrade the reception reliability to a low value of 40 percent. However, our experiments also demonstrate the fact that this decreasing trend is not always true. As depicted, reliability in another scenario is increases from 30 to about 30 to 100 percent on adding the sixth node. This behavior is because of capture effect as the sixth node was located only two meters away and it was in the line of sight of the receiver. Our results suggest that an increase in the number of transmitters, that is high transmission density, not always decreases reception reliability. It can also contribute to the improved performance. So, we have two options, either to find the optimal number of transmitters or to transmit at both low and, transmi low, both low and high transmission densities. Uh, clearly, the first option may not even be practical. So, we opt for the second option. Accordingly, in Splash, we have two rounds of dissemination, each disseminating the full data object. In the first round, only non-leaf nodes participate in forwarding received packets. The rationale is that as typically more than 50 percent of the nodes in a, in a tree are leaf nodes, when such a significant percentage of nodes do not participate in forwarding received packets, we expect nodes to experience low transmission density, thus alleviating scalability problem. In the second round, all nodes participate in transmissions and we expect nodes to benefit from high transmission density by exploiting capture effect or even sender diversity. Our next technique is called opportunistic overhearing. For illustration, consider the second cycle in our tree pipeline and say that the market node experiences packet corruption in this cycle. In the next cycle, the node has to idle because it does not have a valid packet to forward. Instead of idling, what it can do is, it can switch its channel to the top next of nodes and try to overhear the missed packet by when, when it is transmitted by its own peers. This is what we call opportunistic overhearing. Note that this is a very useful technique because it doubles the chance of a node to receive every packet, once from its previous op and then from its own peers. It is well known that the quality of channels vary over both time and location. In order to minimize the effect of the poor channel quality, we use channel cycling in splash. Channel assignment, channel assignment used in one round is different from that is used in another round. For example, here channel 1 is used in round 1 at the first stop nodes, whereas it is used for the last stop in the second round. This way we exploit the fact that different channels behave differently in different parts of a network. Our next technique is to exploit XR coding. After the first two rounds of dissemination, we observed in our experiments that more than 50 percent of the nodes received most data object, but not the full data object. The problem was different nodes had different missing packets. So, one more simple round of dissemination was not that useful. Accordingly, we have a third round based on the XR coding. In this round, every transmission is a, every packet transmission is a, 
XOR sum of a predefined number of object packets. As a coded packet contains information on multiple packets, probability that a packet transmission is useful is increased. As we have witnessed in our experiments, XOR coding significantly helps in increasing the percentage of nodes having the full data object. We have no more rounds that disseminate the full data object. So in Splash, we have, in total, we have three such rounds. Given the, these three rounds, incorporating our key techniques, a node in Splash has six chances to receive a packet. More importantly, each time on a different channel. So if the quality of one or two channels is bad, the packet is still decoded on one of the remaining channels. This is a key advantage of multi-channel systems over their single channel counterparts. Despite of, of, of all our techniques, a few nodes can still have a few missing packets. And such missing data is recovered locally using a simple procedure that involves neighbor querying and data downloading over conventional CSMA CA. And fact that our first three rounds of dissemination leaves about 90% of the nodes with the full data object makes local recovery practical. We implemented Splash in Contiki operating system and we evaluated the performance of our, of our implementation on two large scale test beds. Indriya test bed is deployed at the National University of Singapore and it currently has 139 Telos B nodes. Twist is a testbed facility available at the Technical University of Berlin and it had 90 t mode sky devices at the time of our experiments. We compare Splash against Deluge T2 implemented in TinyOS. Deluge T2 is the most commonly used dissemination protocol in the community. We also compare Splash against Deluge implemented in Contiki. Using Deluge as a baseline allows us to compare Splash against many other existing protocols because most of the protocols in the literature are also compared against Deluge. The table summarizes our results on Indriya for 10 random dissemination trees while disseminating a 32 kilobyte object. In reality, as a dissemination protocol has to be coupled with an application, we execute Splash and Deluge T2 as a part of an application for collecting sensor data. For reference, we also compare against Deluge T2 running standalone as golden image. For Splash, after its three rounds of dissemination, average reliability per node is about 97.5%. And 88% of the nodes have already downloaded the entire data object. Remaining nodes use local recovery to give 100% reliability at every node. The most important result is the dissemination time. Splash is taking only about 25 seconds, whereas Deluge T2 is taking more than eight minutes in its first case. In its second case, it is more than five minutes. So compared to Deluge T2 coupled with an application, we reduce dissemination time by a large factor of 21. And the reduction factor is 12 when compared to Deluge T2 running as golden image. Performance of Splash on Twist is similar to what we observed on Indriya. It is taking the same duration of about 25 seconds for disseminating the same 32 kilobyte object. This demonstrates the fact that network size, size of the network has minimum effect on the performance of Splash because of its pre-pipelining. For Deluge, we use its Contiki's implementation on Twist because executing TinyOS Deluge T2 on remote test beds like Twist is a difficult task. As Contiki's implementation is thin and has uh, minimal functionality, it is taking more than 400 seconds for disseminating a much smaller object of two kilobytes. The table compares Splash against many other existing protocols using Deluge T2 as a baseline. It depicts the reduction factors achieved by these protocols compared against Deluge T2. As you can see, the maximum reduction factor achieved by an existing protocol is only 2.42 whereas it is a large, significantly larger value of 21 for Splash. This is true despite of the fact that Splash is evaluated relatively on the largest number of 139 nodes and using the largest file. We also evaluated 
the contribution of each of the individual techniques that we used in Splash. To summarize, XR coding increases the percentage of nodes having the full data object from about 37 to a significant value of 88%. Uh, and our next technique of opportunistic overhearing decreases dissemination time by 26%. Similar result can be observed for channel cycling that, uh, the, that reduces dissemination time by 25%. In order to evaluate the effectiveness of exploiting transmission density diversity, we conducted a separate set of experiments in which we observed that about 39% of the nodes benefit from low transmission density. And the percentage of nodes that benefit from high transmission density is a lower value of 18. Finally, we will sh we show the time taken for local recovery. Local recovery dominates the dis dissemination completion time. For example, while disseminating a 30 kilobyte object, the first three rounds of dissemination is taking only eight seconds for disseminating most of about 98% of 98.8% of the object, whereas local recovery is taking more time of, of about 12 seconds for disseminating a much smaller remaining portion of 1.2%. This demonstrates the significant overhead involved in CSMSEA, which Splash completely avoids for most of the data object, thus achieving its speed. To conclude, we designed and implemented Splash, a fast data dissemination protocol that reduces dissemination time by an order of magnitude compared to existing solutions. And it is able to do so by mainly exploiting constructive interference and channel diversity. Uh, thank you. Hey, Phil Levis, uh, Stanford University. So on one hand, I think this work is really exciting because this constructive interference paints just a completely different picture as to how you might build you know, low power wireless networks. And you know, sort of for all these different protocols, we've seen the kinds of gains that you can get. But so I would ask then maybe a forward looking question, which is that given this, what are the implications to the physical layer in the sense if we want to actually design a network from the beginning to support protocols like this? What, what would we do? What do we want to do differently? And we're not just going to take 802.11n or something like that. What would you, how would you design a whole network around this thought and this idea? Oh, you mean uh, how do we design altogether new chips or something like that? Yeah. New physical chips? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it depends on the, uh, the modulation technique that you use. Uh, I don't think... Uh, uh, if you increase the data rate, say if it increases more than 250 kilobits per second, uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure whether it can still uh, result in uh, constructive interference. For example, I don't think uh, uh, Wi-Fi devices, for example, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, uh, off-the-shelf Wi-Fi devices, uh, we can achieve uh, uh, constructive interference. Uh, I think it is uh, useful to, you know, um, actually, uh, so I did not get your question correctly. Uh, sorry, uh, one bit, uh, so is, is it? You've, uh, you've, you've mostly answered it, so we can just move on to the next question. Oh, did question. I answer your but question? Thanks, yeah. Okay. <laughs> thanks. So, uh, Masud Musha from USC, I assume that you need a kind of uh, synchronization between devices. Uh, how accurate is that, and uh, for what data rate you can I, keep that Yes, accurate? you need uh, synchronization. Uh, it, was, it is shown that uh, the time displacement among different uh, transmissions should be less than 0.5 microseconds uh, to you know, uh, result in constructive interference. Yeah. I had a question also, Brad Carp, UCL. Uh, I had a question about uh, how constructive interference will scale out as you increase the density of deployment beyond the density that you had in the networks that you looked at in the two test beds. So you have this sort of heuristic that you used, which is that you had non-leaves transmit, yeah. and then you had all nodes transmit. All nodes. And so there are these two classes of nodes that you're hoping will benefit in each of those yeah. situations. If I just envision increasing the density of your network, that threshold that you chose for leaves versus non-leaves, as I increase the density more, 
non-leaves will sort of come to be what was the whole network in a smaller network if I increase the density. Uh, you see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Increase the number of nodes and increase the density. So is that, is, is somehow your constructive interference implementation with these two phases tuned to the density that you happened to have in these test beds? Or if I increase the density, would I still see the same proportions of nodes benefit from these two phases? Uh, it is uh, totally random, uh, you know, uh, because of capture effect. Uh, say you increase the density, uh, if you are lucky, if one node among them captures the receiver, then you'll see 100% uh, reliability. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it can even go to a low value of 0.1, uh, you know, 10% of reliability. So it's uh, entirely random. Uh, so that is the reason it is uh, difficult to find uh, an optimal number of transmitters. So that is the reason why we have two uh, rounds. You know, uh, use both the rounds so that if a node gets benefited from low transmission density, let it, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think partly what I was wondering was, is the low density low enough as the density of the network overall increases? But oh, we can well, we can take that up. We can take that offline. You you answered my question. Uh, I don't think it is enough. Yeah, because uh, even uh, say you increase the density, and uh, only leaf nodes are transmitting, and still the number of leaf nodes that are transmitting may be higher. Right. So That's it my can uh, result in uh, degradation. Right. Okay. Thank you.